Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're just going to wait a little bit while everyone starts getting into our webinar. So great to have you here tonight. We've got a great, a great crowd coming in today. We're really excited. And while we wait for everyone to come in, um, I'll, I'll, I'll begin. Hi. Hello, everyone. My name is Courtney Waring. I'm the Director of Education at the Eric Carl Museum of Picture Book Art. Thank you so much for joining our Educators Night, our Virtual Educators Night with Raul Colon. A couple of updates before we get started. Um, we want to hear from you. We, we, we love the chance that everyone can kind of use the chat and say hello and, you know, tell us where they're from. We'd love to hear it. Uh, when you're in the chat, if you wouldn't mind just making sure that it's marked um, everyone. That way everyone can uh, can see your, your comments. We love that. And um, you'll also be uh, seeing my colleague, Sarah Adamano. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> She'll be really busy in the chat, following along, sharing links with everyone, um, and all sorts of resources. So definitely be, be aware of that chat. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and also the Q&A button. We, we have dedicated time after Raul's presentation where he'll he'll be available to answer questions. So even you know early on in the program, if you've got a question, feel free to put it in the Q and A. We'll be keeping track of that as well. If for any reason we experience technical difficulties and get cut off, we will try as soon as possible to get back on. So just use the. <laughs> so we we just noticed we had one right during our practice session, right before everyone joined. Um, so just go back into the Zoom link uh, that was shared with you in your reminder to to reconnect with us, and hopefully it it will be short in its duration. And uh, tonight's program is also recorded. We're, we're so grateful. Um, so for any reason you miss any part or um, you've had a great time, we hope you do, and you wanna share it with friends and colleagues, we'll have a link on our YouTube channel um, in the next week or two. So before we move it over to Raul's wonderful uh, presentation, we wanted to share the, our, our Carl, um, education team a little bit more about what we've been doing at the Carl. Um, you know, whether it's virtual um, or it's in person, you know, on site at the Carl, we have had all sorts of things happening. So we'd love to share with you a little bit of that uh, right now. So um, David Feinstein, our literacy educator, thank you. He's, he's monitoring our slides. So if you can move over to the next slide, thank you. If you haven't had a chance to come and visit us um, in Western Massachusetts, we hope you do. We have three incredible exhibitions happening right now um, in our central gallery. It is the incredible um, uh, oil paintings from Kadir Nelson from The Undefeated. It won the 2020 Caldecott Medal and the Coretta Scott King Illustrator Award for these beautiful realistic paintings. And uh, its, its author, uh, Kwame Alexander, also received a Newbery Honor for the text. So there are 16 oil paintings all on view. And in addition to the oil paintings, there are just the most incredible sketches of Kadir's work, um, as well as really precious um, content in some cases that show some of his drawings from when he was a young child and a teenager. So really, really special to see. Um, in our Eric Carl gallery, we have color, joy, Eric Carl. Um, sadly, Eric passed away last May. It's, it's our honor to still continue his, his legacy at the museum and share his love of art and stories. And we really wanted through this exhibition to be able to highlight the color and joy he gave to us throughout his 50 plus year career as a children's book author and illustrator. So um, it's really wonderful to look in this, this exhibition and see um, his love of color, his painted tissue papers, um, some really special stage set banners that he created for uh, the Magic Flute. And um, over half of the 70 works on view are works that have never been on view before. Um, so it's really, really special to see. And then in our East Gallery, we have 
um, I Can Do That, the works of Ed Emberley. Um, many of us might have learned, I know I did, I learned to draw through Ed Emberley's drawing books. Um, we were actually so pleased to welcome Ed Emberley at the museum just today with his family to see the exhibition. And it really is um, just so incredible to see how he designed his different books. Um, you know, just, just such incredible talent, you know, the hand lettering, um, you know, the stickers, the stencils, the die cuts, the optical illusions that he created throughout his works. I see Raul shaking his head like, yes, that's, that's pretty amazing. Um, so we, we hope you can, can get to see those. Um, next slide, David. Also new for us is our website. Um, if you haven't visited our website, it's carlmuseum.org. Um, our team during the pandemic worked very hard on updating our website. And um, you know, hopefully you know, as people visit, there's just so much more information that you can see. Um, some of the sections include a museum from home. So if you find that you'll, you know, you just you're not nearby, you can't come and visit us, you can click the museum from home link and see so many different resources and videos and, and virtual content. Um, to, to enjoy. Um, we also have our storyboard. This is a place where um, our Carl team can share different articles. You know, if you want to hear from Sarah and Meg and Ryan in the art studio, they will share, you know, different articles like what they're doing in the studio. If you want to hear from our incredible team in the bookshop about books they're excited about, they write articles. Um, our chief curator, Ellen Kiter, may be writing about different works in our collections. So there's so many wonderful um, articles in there to enjoy. And then we also have online exhibitions. You can check out if you, if you can't make it to the Carl, we actually have exhibitions that are specifically for the website that you can enjoy. Um, and of course, as our education team, we want to highlight the programs and events that we do. You can click on the educations page to see the professional development or the outreach that we're doing, um, but also the events like tonight, you know, what are we doing on site, but also what are we doing virtually? Um, and there's also opportunities if you wanted to, you know, uh, join our, our um, e-blast. So you're always informed of what's coming up. Um, and then of course our incredible shop. <laughs> it's still online. There's so many wonderful things to see. Um, and of course, one of the things are Raul's own books. Raul has signed copies, autographed copies of his books in the shop um, and is also offered if there are books of Raul's that aren't autographed that you notice on the online shop. Um, he's open to, to getting some book plates uh, signed for us. So we're happy to take those orders too. You can just note it on your, your online order and we'll make sure a book plate is included. It might take a little bit longer, um, but just really so many wonderful opportunities and we hope to, to see you at the Carl or uh, see you virtually like we are right now. And I'm going to hand it over to Sarah because Sarah has so many wonderful things happening in the art studio as well. Thank you so much, Courtney. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah. I'm one of the art educators at the Carl. And as a quick update from the art studio, we continue to have in-person programming at the museum to celebrate the Everyday Art Project, which is inspired by the exhibitions that are going on within the space. Our current Everyday Art Project is inspired by the Ed Emberley exhibition. And next week, we're switching it over to a project inspired by the Kadir Nelson exhibition. In addition to our in-person programming. We have a variety of virtual programs as well. We'll be running some virtual workshops this coming week over school vacation break in Massachusetts um, that are free and available to the public over Zoom. And then we have a variety of programs that can be booked in for educators uh, for community groups and school groups. Uh, this page here, I have two suggestions of places to look if you're looking for more resources from the art studio. We have a Making Art Together page on our website, which has over 275 art project ideas, inspiration, materials, and kind of reflections on our process in the art studio, as well as a YouTube playlist on our channel if you're interested in kind of seeing some more visuals or videos about our process and project ideas from the art studio. So hope to see you either in person or through our virtual programs. Thanks everyone and I will pass it I believe back to Courtney. Or David, sorry, I'm sorry, my fellow uh, <laughs> literacy educator, David, who will be talking about more programming. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and like like Sarah, you know, there's a lot happening um, online, virtually, with all of the different ways that we share stories. 
Um, we've got our story time with the Carl, uh, online story time that is interactive, lots of opportunities to look closely, to talk, to sing and play as we read books together. So that's something that we've been doing for a while now. Um, it's now monthly on Facebook Live, and then we have a whole catalog of our previous story times recorded on our YouTube channel. So I encourage you, if you're, if you're looking for that kind of story time experience that you might have at the museum, but can't make it, we try to simulate that as much as possible um, in these programs. Um, so in addition to these kind of online programs, we've been connecting with families and classrooms virtually um, through these interactive literacy building programs centered on picture books and the creative process. Um, I see some of my friends from Worcester in the chat. Hello. Um, you know, though we have programs for pre-K and kindergartners where we really are engaging all of those early literacy skills involving talking and playing and singing together and creating. Um, we have programs um, pre-K all the way up through fifth grade, you know, exploring Eric Carle's creative process. Um, Meg and Sarah in the art studio have some incredible uh, distance learning youth programs where uh, kids get inspired by the illustrations of Eric Carle and other artists uh, to create their own stories through drawing and collage, right? Like Ed Emberley, I could do that. We believe that, right? So kids are the next generation of picture book creators, just like Raul Colon this evening. Um, in addition to those programs for families um, and classrooms, we've got professional development workshops year round. Again, really thinking about the picture book as an art form and exploring ways to engage children through storytelling involving certainly shared reading experiences, but also material exploration and really hopefully giving that inspiration for you in your classrooms to, to get those new ideas, to be motivated and excited yourself to engage your kids in, in that art making and expressing themselves um, and playing creatively together. Oh, and something that is new as well on site is our reading library has really kind of blossomed into an exhibition space in the last couple of years. Um, it's as a way to highlight, you know, certain themes and creators in the world of picture books. Um, our new exhibition, which just opened this month, really fabulous um, collection of over 40 picture books representing over 20 languages called Read the World Picture Books and Translation. Um, it was curated um, with a local partner, Professor Regina Galasso at UMass Amherst and um, her group of Amherst College students. And it's just a remarkable exhibition highlighting the role of translators, showcasing my uh, multilingual and bilingual books and introducing readers to recent English translations um, and their publishers. Um, so the curators who worked on this also created a lot of great additional materials for the exhibition. So if you can't visit us in person, if you visit our website, lots of those are downloadable and available in lots of different languages, um, including a, dis a discussion guide on how to discuss translation with you know, young readers. Um, so great collection of resources on our website. We're also hoping to host a program later um, in the spring, in late April, with some of the translators whose work is featured in this show. Um, there are so many great shows that have come out of the Reading Library. Um, this is no longer on view, but um, boundless picture books about disabilities. Um, you know, is there are still a lot of resources and articles available on the website with book lists. Um, our intern, Trinket Clark intern, Shelly Isaacson just did an incredible job putting this show together. Um, so again, a really great collection of picture books for and about people with disabilities. Um, so encourage you 
to learn more about those shows um, by visiting our website. And I'm gonna pass it back to Courtney. Great, thank you so much, David. And thanks everyone. We just wanted to spend that, that little bit of time to just, just share what we've been doing at the Carl. And David, if you can share the next slide, I just wanna also thank our um, members. They've just been so wonderful in supporting our programs and supporting the museum. And our development office is doing a really incredible member incentive right now. So um, if you're interested in, in uh, becoming a member or rejoining uh, through February, our, um, you can get a free gift. You can choose between an Eric Carl Friends mini print or a really cute, very hungry caterpillar gift bag with all sorts of fun goodies inside. So um, David, we'll go to the next slide. Now it's on to our the main show. We've been we've been waiting for this. We are just so pleased to welcome Raul Colon as our guest speaker for Educators Night. Um, Raul is an award-winning illustrator of over 30 children's books, including Draw, Imagine, Susan Reich's Jose Born to Dance, Frank McCourt's Angel Angel's Christmas, and Jill Biden's Don't Forget, God Bless Our Troops. Cologne is the recipient of the Golden Kite Award, the Pora Bell Prey Award, and the Thomas Rivera Mexican American Children's Award. And in just last year, in 2021, he was a Carl Honor Artist Honoree for lifelong innovation in the field. Um, and also just a few months ago, the Carl was so honored to showcase Raul, some of Raul's art in our uh, special exhibition, Speechless, The Art of Wordless Picture Books. So throughout his career, Raul has inspired readers and illustrators alike with his exceptional artistry, unique techniques, and powerful stories of people who never give up on their dreams. So it seems only fitting that tonight Raul is going to talk about how daydreaming can support one's creative process. <laughs> and he's got some really wonderful images that we're going to share. So David, if you want to bring down this PowerPoint and I'll hand it over to you, Raul. Okay, great. Well, um, here I am. So this is one of the uh, daydreams that became tr true. Um, I am actually, um, actually, we, I decided to talk about daydreaming. And I mentioned that as a theme because um, that's what is needed today or, or at any time to uh, invent anything or create anything new. You have to daydream about it. In, in other words, the, the Wright brothers had to daydream in a way how to get a machine that's uh, heavier than air into, in, into flight, right? Into space and fly around with it. So nobody had really done it and uh, they had to figure that out. They had to dream about it. They had to imagine it. So let me start with my own experience. Um, <clears throat> I think I'm, I'm probably in, in second grade uh, in New York and I go home and they used to give you the little paper with your books at the end of the day, in middle of the school year, I guess for your report card, right? And you uh, would walk in into the house with your little tangerine paper. It wasn't a card. And I give it to my mom because that's probably a progress report or something like that. I don't, I don't know if what exactly it was called at the time. So there it is, my grades, uh, comments from the teacher and what I've been doing during the school year. So I'm in second grade and my mom starts reading it and my mom and her broken English at some point when she's looking at the paper, looks at me and says, oh, there's a word here. Do you understand what this is over here? Where there's a word that says you, you daydreaming? What, what's that? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm, I don't know what that means, daydreaming. I'm in second grade. I don't know that. So, uh, of course, uh, an hour later, my sister arrives and she asks my sister about this word because she wanted to know what was the teacher saying about me and daydreaming so my sister uh volunteered very happily she was in sixth grade so she had an idea what it was and she told my mom oh, he's not paying attention he looks out the window or is looking away or something that's what daydreaming is so of course 
I had to hear him. You're, you're, you're what? You're not, you're, you're daydreaming. You're not paying attention. Da, da, da. So that was the first time I think I learned the word daydream. And sure enough, I, I didn't know I was doing it, but I, I imagine I was, and the teacher was right. I was daydreaming. But here's the thing about daydreaming. It's, it's, it's what led me to where I am here now. It's, I arrived here because I used to daydream a lot. And I still do. That's, that's how it works. And uh, so I, like, I would have liked to go back to the teacher and see, you know, I, I did daydream, but here I am uh, illustrating picture books because I do exactly that, daydream. And uh, let her know that it, it worked out for me. But what is daydreaming exactly? Because there's two kinds of daydreaming, and that's what I want to mention today. There's bad daydreaming. Let's admit it. There's daydreaming where you take off, disappear in your head, and then all of a sudden somebody calls you or talks to you or interrupts you, or your teacher interrupts you. And uh, they ask you, what are you thinking about? What are you doing? And you wake up from the daydream, and you um, don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I, what I was thinking. That's the bad kind of daydream. Le leads to nothing, helps with nothing. You just disappeared. There's a good kind of daydreaming, which is the one where you uh, disappear in your mind somewhere. But when somebody wakes you up from it, you know exactly what you were thinking. You know where you were. Oh, I was imagining, I was looking at the sky, you know, and I noticed that the stars, I was looking at the stars and I noticed that uh, I was thinking, I'm supposed to be looking at planets or stars that were there and the light, it takes light years for that light to reach us. So am I actually looking at a star or the light that just got to me and the star's not there anymore? I bring that up because that's one of the things I was thinking about when I was young. <laughs> uh, the stars take light years, that light takes light years to get here. So maybe that planet's out there. What if I could get a telescope or somebody invented a telescope that was so strong we could look at what that star is showing us, the surface of a planet or star so far away. Maybe we could see something now that happened, you know, a thousand years ago. And maybe that's like time travel. I thought that stuff, <laughs> that's part of daydream. But I feel that's the good daydreaming because that's the daydream that leads to creating things. That's the kind of thought that I feel makes you, there's, there's gotta be a little bit of um, insanity with it. <laughs> that's the thing, creativity. You have to be a little insane. Actually, somebody once said that a writer was, somebody who had learned to misbehave because that's that's where you get the all the uh, juicy stuff when you write so yes there's got to be some kind of craziness some kind of inventiveness when you're thinking crazy thoughts and you know this happens to everybody especially when you're sleeping at night when you dream actually dream not daydream and that's why people say i had a, a crazy dream the craziest dream well, those are the kinds of things uh, creative people, writers, artists, musicians think about, but not at night during the day. And we, not, we know how to get there. So that's the kind of daydreaming we're talking about. So uh, having said that, I think I should start focusing now on how I have, I've used that crazy daydream, the imagination that I knew I had since I was a kid. At first, I thought it was a bad thing. Don't day, don't, don't think, don't do this. I used to fill my notebooks with all these drawings, which uh, instead of you know writing all the math problems and, uh, and talking to all the, or putting down all the uh, words that the teacher was putting on the blackboard or telling us, I always had in the margin of my notebooks, 50,000 little doodles and drawings. And here's the thing, I never remember that I did them. I just knew they were there. But when I opened the notebook, ooh, I drew that. So I've always, I know I was always in that mode. 
and my colleagues, believe me, a lot of other illustrators have gone through exactly the same thing. So now let's see how I applied that. When I became uh, an illustrator, I, um, I decided to do that consciously. Uh, I didn't necessarily go to school when I decided. I had already taken a commercial art course, but I decided at one point I was working in a graphics department for 10 years at a uh, TV station, educational television. I said, I want to freelance. So I did consciously decide I want to start freelancing, put a portfolio together and do it. So I wanted to be an illustrator, went for it. In my career as an illustrator, at one point, somebody saw <clears throat> my work in one of the magazines, actually in the um, New York Times book review, and they offered me uh, the chance to illustrate a book. So let's look at that first uh, piece of uh, work because a lot of people always ask me, and, it's, and you've probably seen a lot of this before, how does a book get started? Well, uh, this is an example of uh, how it gets started. Book, usually a picture book, and I'm talking a picture book here, usually uh, consists of 32 pages, right? Um, and uh, so I, I have to make a little mock-up when I get a manuscript of pictures that will fill those 32 pages. So usually I get a manuscript and then I start sketching what I've read from the manuscript. If I like the manuscript, obviously I wouldn't do it if I don't like it. And um, here we see what I did after I had thought about my own manuscript because um, I already drawn another book called Draw and um, had it accepted and published. And my uh, editor, Paula Wiseman asked me uh, and Simon and Schuster to uh, write another one, wordless, wordless picture. So in this case, what you're looking at it is all these little squiggly little drawings here. These are thumbnails. So it looks a little bigger here, but it actually they're very small. After I had figured what I wanted to do with the book about a boy visiting the museum. And as you can see, a lot of this stuff you see here actually became a full fledged finished drawing. I mean, here's, for instance, uh, if you can see the uh, number 1415, right? Page 1415 right here on the right. I see the lion there and the gypsy. Well, I wanted to use that painting in the book. So I already had that idea. Um, over here, I have the boy on number 10 and 11 towards the left here trying to climb into a painting of people dancing. Well, that was one of the ideas I wanted to use completely. Um, Picasso was in it, as you can see on number 22 and 23. I had the idea that I should use a painting from Picasso. And I had looked through some books about with to find different paintings I liked that I maybe wanted to use for this boy's adventure at the museum. And uh, that's how I just came up with these little uh, thumbnails. And eventually those thumbnails led to what became the uh, full sketches. But uh, if you notice, I only have 32 because that's usually what a picture book is. The, the length of a picture book is 32 pages. That's a normal picture book. What happened is that as I went along uh, illustrating this and doing more sketches, it kept growing. And I think the book ended up with like 42 pages, 45 pages. I mean, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger and longer and longer. And uh, I just kept drawing away and I kept sending sketches and uh, the imagination took over, the daydreaming took over and it became the uh, 
book you see, uh, if you ever get a chance to see it, uh, it became the book Imagine. If you look back at the beginning, if we can move back to the top, you will see that I had a different title on it. It was, I was thinking of calling it Artsum. And it was, again, the editorial department decided maybe Imagine was a better idea. I wasn't too happy with the idea of Imagine because it was a famous song with that title, but it worked. And by the way, there's also a, a book I'll show you that has that word and yet another book. So there's a few books out there with the title Imagine, but we changed it to Imagine. And this became the book Imagine and it grew into that. If, let's go to the next piece which is one of the sketches. All right, so I wanted this boy going to the museum, enjoying himself at the museum, looking at the paintings, but I wanted him to interact with the paintings. Well, one of the uh, things I wanted him to do was have, um, have him doing something with one of the characters in a painting. Um, so I wanted him to dance. That was one of the things. Maybe I'll have some characters come out of the paintings and join the boy in a dance. And as you can see in the sketch, that's exactly what they're doing. And by the way, I had seen these prints by uh, Goya, Goya, the uh, artist, Spanish artist. And um, there's some movement he has in one of his paintings or, or drawings of people dancing, a couple of people dancing. And I I like that feeling and I have to say uh, he influenced this piece a lot. So this is one of the sketches I finally had to develop because I wanted a boy to interact with those paintings he saw in the museum. And there he is dancing away with the, uh, the uh, character from the painting, which is Amatisse, by the way. It's from his series Jazz. And it's not actually a painting, it's a print, I, I guess. So I used uh, the Matisse to do this. Why the Matisse? Let's go to the next piece and we'll see why. Why did I end up do using Matisse and uh, the boy dancing with Matisse? Because this was the original idea I had with that uh, Matisse. He had another painting that actually had, was titled Dance, I think. And uh, it was this famous painting he did of a circle of people dancing around. And uh, that's the idea, the original idea I had. This boy's gonna dance with all these people in this painting, Matisse painting. And uh, he's gonna join in the, and get join the circle and circle around and dance with him. That was the idea. Uh, editorial department said, uh, I don't know if you can do that. There were two reasons. The editorial department so, and uh, also there's a research department and legal department in all these uh, publishers uh, offices. They decided that uh, legally, maybe I couldn't use that painting. Uh, even though um, I'm not supposed to use any of them because a lot of them are copyrighted, but this one was so open and I had to show most of the painting that they said, I don't think you can legally use it. So that was one idea that I loved and I probably wasn't gonna be able to use. As you can see, the boy was actually gonna join in and dance with them. Second idea or problem they had was that these figures are not clothed. <laughs> so goodbye, Marie Sendai. I can't draw anybody who's, who looks like they don't have, not wearing anything. So that was the second reason, which to me, I kind of argued about it a little bit. Wait a minute, wait a minute, they, they're figures, they're not. Uh, somebody in the Midwest not going to like it, you know, it may be controversial. It, it's a Matisse, it's, you know, so that was the other reason. So that's why I went and finished the, the piece or got the final piece using a Matisse um, painting, but this time, uh, the other painting from Jazz, his other series of prints, and that's what um, <clears throat> worked for the book. So you had to adjust. So, so the daydreaming sometimes becomes, uh, you have to be flexible. Like somebody mentioned before uh, when we were, when I joined the, this group. Uh, and things are a little serendipity and it has to be a little insane. So 
you have to be able to adjust. So I went to the other drawing. If we move to the next piece, we keep going because this one is repeated a few times. Uh, you can see here why you have to be flexible because look over here. No, no, can't use the sculpture. I had a sculpture of Rancusi, I think it was in here somewhere. It's covered with a piece of paper here. And they didn't want that. Copyright problems. Uh, here I had to switch the guitar for the mandolin. So I, not all the characters were carrying the instruments they actually carried in the paintings that I had in the book. And there's a lot of Matisse and, and some other painters there at, uh, that uh, I used their iconography for, uh, for the book. And I also had to make sure that I always covered whatever painting I showed in the book. And there's a few of them, like I said, the Picasso is prominent, uh, that I always had the boy or somebody in front of it and I distorted it enough and didn't show all of it for copyright reasons. So that's why you have to be flexible in many ways. And uh, so I, a lot of things were taken out and I put other things in and that's part of the uh, process. But my daydreaming about this book remained pretty good. They actually let me do a lot of what I wanted and it worked out for me. Moving on to the next one, people ask me then, Okay, so you do all these sketches, you put the book together, what's the next process? Well, the next process is actually painting the thing. And um, that's what you see here. I uh, always use a wash, and this is from an article on a magazine called Step Magazine. But this is how I actually start my finals. It's always a wash. You can see that I already drew uh, and on the first illustration there, a little piece from the article. I drew some characters and some lines and I have everything drawn out, except that underneath that drawing, there's a light, light golden wash. And I always start with that almost white, very light golden wash. And then, I start putting darker washes around the characters and all that. And, and if you see, you notice they're all sepia. It's a lot of sepia and a lot of brown colors and oranges and yellows. And that's the underpainting of everything I do. After I've done a lot of that, then uh, comes the uh, pencil, as you can see in that other piece, second piece there. At the bottom, where you see my fingers holding a strange instrument, a lot of people ask me, how do I etch into my uh, drawings? Well, at this point, when I've done this wash, I usually etch into the paper before I put the pencil or in all the colors. in. So this is called right here, that round metal, looks like a coin, has these prongs. And it has a nice name. It's called the uh, Scratcher. Trademark Scratcher. And that's what I use. And um, I don't think they make it anymore. Or if they do, it's top secret because a lot of people have tried to find this when I've given talks in the past and they can't find them online, except if you go to Amazon, maybe you'll find them. If anybody knows of any place they sell it, let me know. I did prepare myself and I bought uh, at least three or four of these just in case I lose one. But I'm still using the original one I bought. So it's been 30 years of it. <laughs> so I still have it. On the last little piece here where you see the face of the boy, I put some more color now because now the color pencils are coming in. And uh, sometimes I use the... Uh, Exact don't have to remove a color or scratch some more. It all depends. And I etch, scratch, remove paint, add paint, and it's watercolor, by the way, to everything I do. And then the color pencil on top. And if I have to remove color pencil, I do that too. Sometimes I use tape to remove color. So that's the process and how it starts and how I start painting. 
On the next up page, you'll see, I think a little more of what I do with color. Over here, you see some color studies that I do. And um, they're um, from anything I, I can get my hands around. Uh, you know, like this was probably a, on the left side, that smaller piece of the face. Uh, it's probably some illustration or photograph I saw of a statue or I can't remember exactly somewhere. And I decided to uh, make my own version of it. And the, again, the, as, you, as you see, there's tape on it. So these are not huge paintings or anything. This is uh, probably a couple of inches tall and an inch wide, something like that, or a little over that. Uh, the other group of colors you see here, there's a guy there, there's a woman in red or magenta, somebody's shirt, trousers. This is actually from a movie. And I had a video of it when uh, we still used video and had videotapes. So I would pause the video because I thought this movie had so many nice color combinations that I studied the actual uh, frames of the movie for the colors. And I, I tried to uh, imitate what I saw on the screen. And, uh, I did this, these color studies based on different scenes from the movie. I think it was called, a, I think it was a Vietnamese movie. It, it was an Asian movie. I can't remember which country exactly, but uh, The Scent of Papaya, I think was the name, something like that. And uh, it came out years ago. But the colors in that movie were so uh, beautiful that I just had to study it. So this is another thing you do when you're day, daydreaming. You don't only lose your mind into the ether and start thinking about crazy things and take off. When you see something that really interests you, you, you go after it. And um, that's what I do sometimes. I watch a lot of movies, I'll, I'll admit that. And uh, I've gotten great ideas by watching how movies are shot and the colors color palettes in the movies. Right now, Wes Anderson is one guy I'm gonna study a lot. Uh, he's a director that uses color very, very be well, beautifully. So I have to keep that in mind. Let's see some more uh, samples here of it. All this right here, as you see, are just slots and color studies. So I combine colors. I, on the first little box there, the yellow box on the top left, you see an A and a Y, a V, and then RMG. Well, that's aural in yellow. I think that's how you pronounce it. Or it's a tricky word to say. Aureolin yellow or aurelin yellow, viridian and rose matter genuine all combined together and give you this color. If you use it, you know, in the measure that that I used it, I, I can't remember exactly what it was. When I put viridian over it, you see this is the viridian uh, to the right there, a little line of viridian, the light green. But then with the yellow and the, and the RMG, it becomes this ochre, beautiful ochre. So I studied that from a book on a color, a watercolors, which was perfect. That really dark one is Aralyn yellow again, viridian, and now Alizer and Crimson. And uh, it gives you that nice dark brown. And sometimes I use that dark brown when I have a dark sky in the background. And on top of that, I use violet blue with my Prismacolor pencils. And the contrast is beautiful, so. But as you can see, all these colors stand out because I use um, what they call translucent watercolors. And um, that's what I mostly uh, use in the, the background of my paintings, the underpainting. And it helps those colors really uh, shoot out, stick out. They're almost uh, luminescent. When I put a colored pencil over it, I let the texture of the paper show some of these colors that are underneath and they show through. Let's go to the next piece then. 
and you'll see more of that, yeah. All right, so I gave you the colors, how I work with them, and then a color pencil on top, all that. And then these are layers of color. But all of a sudden, people forget that there's other colors. I, I, I consider black and white a color. And uh, I have a sketchbook that I, or many sketchbooks, by the way, where I use uh, black and white pen and ink. And again, you got to keep the daydreaming going, but it's not always about beautiful, happy thoughts and nice things. Sometimes the world is a little cruel. And one of the cruelest things that happen in the world are, is war. And during the uh, first, uh, I think it was the first Iraq war. I uh, wasn't too happy with what was happening. Um, I had thoughts about it. And I started sketching in a book, my feelings about the war. So I took a pen and ink and started drawing uh, these sketches about how I felt about the war. The funny thing is that this was happening, This kind of a dark daydreaming happened in a beautiful place. I was actually in San Diego, in La Jolla, San Diego, on a beautiful day, drawing some of these things. Uh, and the, the most beautiful day, which I should have been looking at the sun, enjoying the air, but my thoughts were with the war. And I was sitting at a table outside of um, a small restaurant in La Jolla, San Diego just drawing away some of these. And then uh, when I got to my studio, I finished them. So here's some other examples. There's another example coming. We can go to the next one. And I wanted it to be as strong as I could make it about how I felt about the war. And do the next one. And here's one of the um, things I had read in the newspaper that soldiers were being targeted with. And for the first time, I started hearing the term IEDs, improvised explosive devices, were killing thousands of Americans. And uh, they couldn't defend themselves. It, it was one of those things that you just couldn't you know, see the enemy. It just You just walked by or you drove by you got blown up. So they became a target. That's the way I saw it. And here's the thing about putting sometimes your feelings and ideas down and what your thoughts are. Because I, I did all these drawings in San Diego, not all of them, most of them. And I did a bunch of others. I didn't include them here. <clears throat> and some are pretty gruesome, I have to say. I, I went out. I went out. But um, I put this down. And um, I kind of exercise all these uh, feelings about the war. And uh, it's something you do. It's a form of communication. But in my sketchbook, a lot of this stuff is, doesn't get seen. You, you're seeing it. Probably you and a few other people have seen this in the history of uh, what uh, my career, because <laughs> I haven't shown this to a lot of people. But after a while, maybe three or four months after I did this, I had them stored somewhere in my, my, my sketchbook was in my library somewhere. And one day I took him out and I said, you know, I feel so strongly about this. I'm gonna send these to the New Yorker and see what Francois Mouly and who was the art, who was the art director at um, the New Yorker thinks about him. Cause I had done some work with her. And I uh, sent these war illustrations. I sent four or five of them to her in, um, in an email, and she uh, responded. She actually is quickly. And they decided, you know, we want to use one of these pieces for the cover. So one of those pieces that I had just thought about in San Diego and was just basically, like I said, daydreaming about ended up, and let's see the next page, please. And the New York. It's one of the covers I did. And as you can see, the date was 2004, May 24th, right in the middle of the war. 
and it was published. And as you notice, it's not my usual style with colored pencils and all that stuff. It's pen and ink and some watercolor. And that's the uh, image that was published. Supposedly, they got a lot of letters about this and not all of them positive. But that's part of being uh, original, part of being an artist, part of using that your brain, the daydreaming and putting it down. Sometimes it's messy. Sometimes it's insane. But that's how you get published. That's how things get done. And that's how you express yourself. And other people uh, get to express themselves too. So there's an interaction when you share your art with other people. But this is not the only thing I do because they also got nice things from me at the New Yorker. Let's see the other piece I did for them in a while before. This is my usual uh, look, right? And this was the first piece I ever did for the New Yorker, uh, as you can see in the year 2000. That was the first time I got published on the cover. I had done work inside, uh, little portraits and things like that, uh, and full pages, but never on the cover. This was the first one. And the funny thing is that the year, I guess, 1999, must have been 99, because it was a year before, I submitted this and they accepted it and they bought it to publish it. So it, why did it take a year to put this down? Well, because uh, in 1999, it hardly snowed, <laughs> I, apparently. And I remember the uh, editor told me, you know, we'd like to use your cover. We bought it and everything, but we're not gonna publish it because it didn't snow. Got too little snow, nothing happened. So they, they reserved it, they held it. So I couldn't see my cover, I was dying to see it. My first cover with the New Yorker, had to wait a year to finally see the uh, finished product. And finally in that year, it, it snowed enough for that. And here the last piece I think, oh, not the last bit, but here's another piece I wanna include because remember we were talking about daydreaming and all that. Well, the daydreaming consists of putting different concepts together. And the way you create things is that they call it a uh, conceptual art. And I did a lot of that for um, a lot of companies. So as an illustrator, I not only did picture books, this is what I originally used to do, uh, magazines and this kind of work. And concepts are what people wanted. And as you can see, this was a thing, very simple, a puzzle or a face that is really a puzzle. And it was about Anderson Consulting Company and um, career opportunities. And they wanted to show some, some idea that they put the pieces together and make a, a whole person out of it. You know, somebody's career can be put together, that kind of thing. And it was kind of simple to think of a concept of puzzle pieces and a face that could be male or female, didn't matter and um, gender neutral, I guess. So uh, it, it could include everybody. And conceptual thinking requires a lot of um, what they call horizontal thinking. So even though I mentioned a lot about daydreaming and imagining things, when you're working for magazines, when you're working for the, the New York Times or these firms, they want ideas from you and they want them now. So. You can't just sit back and they dream and hope you get inspired. The illustrator that works in the commercial world has to come up with ideas quickly. So you don't have the time to get inspired and wait. And the conceptual thing is a way to help. And it's, these are techniques that you use. And I, and I tried to teach this in a classroom once where you take two disparate elements and try to put them together. For instance, um, I visited a class once and I said, I'm gonna teach you how horizontal thinking works. And we did three sets of cards, which a bunch of cards were put in a box that were about things. And then another bunch of cards were put in another box, second box that was about people, right people. And then there was another box 
where we put animals. And what happened is I told the children, each child can pick two cards out of the three boxes, but one from bo one box and a card from another box. Whatever you pick out, that's what you're going to try to draw, right? So one box has people in it, portraits. Another box has animals. Another one has things. So if a child picked a card from the box that had all the things, say he picked in an airplane, and then he picked another card from the box that had animals, say he got a shark. Well, he had to sit down and try to draw a new type of species called a jet shark or a shark jet. And they did. The kids tried to create. And that's what horizontal thinking is. You take two concepts that are separate, put them together, and you create something new. And that's how you get ideas. And that's how you can work quickly to come up with three or four or five different ideas for different jobs. That's, that's the kind of thing I used in uh, my career as an illustrator. Conceptual thinking, horizontal thinking, and also something called vertical thinking. And so I tried to explain here a little bit. So even though we like to daydream and imagine things and take our time doing it, when, it's, when you hook, the clock is right on you, you have to have other techniques that help you come up with ideas. And that's some of them. Finally, I want to end it with one of my favorite books I illustrated. My Mama Had a Dancing Heart was the last, second book I illustrated and was the first book that won an, an award at the New York Times as one of the top 10 illustrated books. And Draw was the second one. So I'm glad I decided to join the crowd that works putting picture books together. But as you can see, it all started with that boy daydreaming in class and filling his notebooks with drawings. So I hope you enjoyed the, uh, my uh, sharing of this to, with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raul. That was incredible and just wonderful to hear you talk and share your, your process and your stories and your picture with us. I'm seeing all wonderful comments in the chat. And I, we, we've got some time now for, for some questions. So I've got some in the Q&A, so I'll bring those up. Um, our first one, how does your culture inform the way you make art? My culture, okay, let, let me speak about my culture. Uh, let's see, I, I grew up in New York, uh, well, till I was, I was in New York till I was 10 years old. So here's, here's how it went, that's, that's a good question because my mama had a lot to do with this and uh, my father. One good thing that happened to me is that uh, my mom was very religious. And while I was going to school and, and I was, we had lived in uh, Manhattan, I like moved to the Bronx. I'm in school going, learning English, you know, got my books, you know, Dick and Jane, those books, even though to tell the truth, I always read my sister's books. She was older, she was in sixth grade. So I, I liked her books better. They have better illustrations, let's put it that way. Uh, I started to read in English and learn English, but my mom wanted me to learn Spanish at the same time. So as I'm learning English in school and I'm only like uh, in second grade, third grade, I had to learn Spanish at home. Not only speak Spanish, I had to learn to read and write it's because she wanted me to study the Bible. So couple of hours a week I had to and I wanted to watch television and uh, she would make me come out we're gonna study the bible you're gonna have to read so I had to learn to read and write in Spanish so in that sense knowing two languages which is part of my culture you know bilingual was a great thing and learning them very young and learning them very well uh, informed me Later on, we moved to Puerto Rico, and I had lived in the city all this time, so uh, till I was 10, like I said. And so all I had seen were buildings and things like that. And, and one thing that I've said in other talks, I was very sick all the time in New York. I had chronic asthma, so I hardly went out. But when I did go out, I went to 
play with my friends. In those days, you could go anywhere. And we go to junkyards and disappear and play down this two or three blocks away from the house. And so I had that. But when I went to Puerto Rico, I lived in a city, but my cousins lived in the country. So that was the first time I got to see the country in a way that I hadn't seen before. They had a cow. They had uh, some of my cousins uh, lived in a kind of a farm. They had a cow, a couple of pigs. So there I was trying to milk a cow, doing things like that. So that was part of what informed everything I did. So the islands, both of them, Manhattan and Puerto Rico inform what I how I draw and probably helps with the way I see color. Probably it helps while the way I see the darker side of things, you know, the grays and the New York is always the grayer colors for me in my head. And Puerto Rico is a bright, beautiful, you know, blues and aquas and sunny days that, uh, and rainy days that I experienced. Mountains, streets, a lot of cars in one place mountains in the other. A lot of cars in the city, but when I escaped into the mountains was different. So my culture, my Spanish has helped me to get to where I am. And, and actually when I speak in different schools, uh, it helps that I, I can speak both languages because I, I relate to a lot of children who can't speak English yet. They've arrived to this country and they usually, when I'm invited to a school, I get to meet those young children it's, and it's great. So yes, I, uh, I'm glad I uh, uh, got to participate in both cultures while uh, I've been here. And as you talk about the, the spaces that, that you've grown up in and they're inspired by, we have a question also about, about your materials and your process. Um, they're asking, what kind of paint, pencils, and paper are you using? Are you using a light table? And how did you develop the technique of scratching? Okay, very good questions. Yeah, well, I use Prismacolor pencils. I would use Colorama pencils if I could. They don't. Have, I don't think they make them anymore. Maybe they do. Uh, I've seen some other pencils in the, when I go to the art store that I sometimes buy other pencils. So sometimes I uh, mix them up. But Prismacolor is. The, I know all the colors. Uh, in that uh, in uh, Prismacolor, so I'm very familiar with them. That's what I use. They're not the ones that you use with watercolor. They're the normal, soft, real expensive Prismacolors. Not very thin, the real ones, which are semi-soft. Uh, watercolors, I use Winston or Newton, Newton, and that's my underpainting always. Paper, I use this Italian paper called Fabriano. And other times I use arches. Um, I use the cold press, sometimes hot press, but cold press has a lot of uh, cold press, but the soft cold press, which has a small texture to it. And that texture you see in the drawing sometimes, uh, that a lot of people ask me about, how do you get the texture? Well, the texture is the paper. And when I go over the uh, watercolor with the colored pencils, I let that texture show through. And like I said, because it's textured, the color underneath also shows through and it forms the uh, color on top. And I put layers of color, by the way. So uh, those are techniques. The scratching was a mistake. Again, it's gotta be serendipity. It's gotta be messy, insanity, whatever. I had a, a when I used to work at this television station, uh, the educational tele TV, there was a, uh, woman named Anna Lee, but she, she became my boss actually, uh, from Finland. And she loved doing scratch board, which is a process that uses what it says, scratching. You paint the board, a board, white board with black ink, and then you scratch into it and the white comes out and you can draw with it. You know, the drawing comes out that way. And there was this instrument she showed me, look, I bought this instrument because I can use it for scratch board. Well, the thing is she never used it. She, she had it in a plastic bag. She ordered it and she left it in the office and I would see it every day there. I said, you know, give me that thing. I'm going to use it, fool around with it. And I did own my own little scratch board and tried it. But then I said, what if I use color with this? And I started experimenting with it in color. And when I left the job 
to become a freelancer, I asked her, can I keep the uh, scratcher? That's the name of the trademark. And uh, she said, yeah, I'm, I'm not using it. So I took it with me. And when I got here to New York, oh, I'm in New York, so you're in, in other places. But when I got to my place in New York, uh, my studio that I uh, rented, I uh, immediately ordered a couple more to make sure that if I ever lost one, I had another one to replace it. And it's that instrument that I uh, used to etch into the paper. And I use, you know what? Another quick, good question. I use an empty pen sometimes to scratch, do other mm -hmm. scratches into the paper. And all that before I put colored pencil on top. Oh, wow. Well, so and I, I, I love that you, you, know, you shared with us your commercial work. And uh, Alex, our, our director of the Carl is, is here as well. Some of you are the Carl friends that you're familiar with. But Alex is asking, um, she loves how you're talking about your New Yorker covers. And can you talk a little bit about your experience working in commercial illustration for magazines, newspaper? And do you see opportunities there for illustrators who are just starting out? It looks even more competitive now. OK. Um... Well, let's start with that one. Yes, competitive. Yes, it is. Uh, it is very competitive. Um, but I do know illustrators that are young and are doing well. So it's shrinking. I have to say it's very hard because of technology now. There's not a, as many magazines as there used to be. I mean, you have to remember, uh, Look Magazine, uh, Time, not Time, uh, Life Magazine, in the 1960s and 70s, there were these magazines that were, if you've seen those fashion magazines today uh, in the store, they're kind of big format. It was great to illustrate that because you opened a spread and it was like almost a poster. But that's non-existent basically. So there's few magazines, but uh, still in the industry, you can do a lot of work uh, for, I know a friend, uh, Idel Rodriguez, who used to work for Time Magazine. He was a, an art director there. He just did the cover and the inside art for um, a group called uh, Spoon. Spoon, yeah. And um, he just did that, and I'm sure he got paid well for it. <laughs> and uh, he's done dozens of covers for magazines around the world. There's Spiegel uh, up in. Uh, down in Germany and other places in Europe, here. And he's, that's his career. He only does magazines and posters. And he did illustrate a book, a couple of books, one about Jimi Hendrix recently. So he does both and he's, he's successful as a editorial artist. Uh, there's other younger illustrators Victor Ney, I think is her name. She oh, right. is very young, basically, and she's she was an editorial artist and now does books too. So you can make it. It's just that it's very competitive and you you you, you better daydream a lot. Yeah. And keep your eyes open. Like I said, you're you always look at possibilities constantly. And you have to get you have to offer something that's original. And you, to you get talk, there, you got to work at it. And you talk to us about your your daydreaming as a child. We have a question that's asking: Do you think kids today still daydream much when their minds are filled with so many images and animations, all the things online, TV, movies? No, they don't. They do not. However, when I go to schools, here's the funny thing about it: when I go to schools. Uh, visit schools and talk to children. I, I, I always joke that they're, they're playing the video game, you know, and, and I, I forget the names of all the video games. My, I have grandchildren, so, so I know that, what they play. Uh, but I, I, I asked them about it, and you know, how many like to read? And some raise their hands, and I say, how many like to play video games? Ah, the whole class. <laughs> so th that's what they do. But I say, you know, there's another machine that you don't use a lot of when you're playing video games because you're only using it. The, you use this machine just to play the games and, it, and it's very good for it. Right? You use certain parts of this machine to help you win those video games you like to win. 
but this machine can do a lot more than that. So they go, what, what, what machine are you talking about? I say, well, it's, it's the other one that's even better than the video games. This one here, the brain. How many times do you use it? So I tried to indicate to them, look, let's look outside, see what people can do when they use their brain uh, all the way. So I start pointing to them that if you look out the window, you will see cars going by, right? Well, you know that somebody sat down and had to draw that car. Those cars you see, some, some, somebody used his brain and drew, and there's the car. He designed it. Actually, look at your shoes. They look at their sneakers. Somebody, those shoes you're wearing, somebody had to sit down, create those shoes, design them. Put a line here, put a, an arc over here, put color there. The designer did that. Somebody drew that. He used his brain to imagine something like those shoes you wear. The shirt, the clothes, everything you wear. I tell him to look at the building. Look at the building, you know. Somebody sat down and do all this. They have to imagine it and design it. So I start trying to get them to understand that you, if you use your brain, you can create anything because everything around us requires drawing and art, everything. Everything you see, and I, I take it all the way to the cereal box when they go to the supermarket, everything. The movies, everything. It's drawing, art, and drawing, art, writing, Everything is creation. It's not just engineers doing math. Number one, cause of beautiful living today is art everywhere. So they start getting it, that drawing and using your imagination is, is the way to go. And they start joining in. Then if we do any exercise, they, they start getting it into it. So I tell them when you read a book, you're using that machine and then sometimes if you read a book that has no pictures you have to imagine what's going on well you're using your machine but you're using a lot more than when you do this and they get it they get it they, they kind of listen so that's what i try to bring at least make and them think, conscious and i think actually that's a perfect way for us to wrap up with this final question that's in especially as i see your background role which is just <laughs> peppered with incredible books. Um, the question is, do you have any art book recommendations in Spanish or English? Anything that's inspired you? And, and of course, anyone in the in participating are welcome to answer that too. I see the amazing Pat Cummings is, has joined us this evening. So I bet she's- oh, great. Hello, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, here's the thing. Um, that book I mentioned, uh, I did mention it, I, I used a book called Making Color Sing. I can't remember the author's name right now, but the title is Making Color Sing. It's a watercolor book. And it's the best one I've seen because uh, the author, she actually shows you how you combine different colors. And she's the one where I learned translucent colors are like turning on a light. So loved her work. So it's, that's one book I recommend. There's other books. Uh, there's another book on proportions. Um, can't remember the title now, but uh, any book that sh teaches you proportions of the body is important to uh, read anatomy, any anatomy book. I do recommend that people, if they can, buy the uh, Society of Illustrators Annual or order it. it. Comes out every year. And you will see all the works of every illustrator uh, that's successful today uh, and do work for people around the world. And you will see examples of all the work the illustrators uh, do. That's what I used when I started my career. I used to, we used to get the annual in, in this place I worked every year and I would go through it. And that's how I learned. Ah, so this is how you do it. And, and I have my favorite artists, uh, things like that. And I started putting a portfolio together by learning what these guys were doing. So the annual uh, of uh, Society of Illustrators is a good one to have. There's another one called American Artists or American, yeah, I think it's American Art that comes out also uh, an annual. American Illustration, I think it's called. 
that's another good one. And you will see, also, we were talking about young illustrators. You'll see a lot of young people who, who get their work in there, and they're doing great. Well, thank you so much, Raul. This has been such a special evening hearing from you and, and seeing your work. And um, on behalf of all of us, it's just been so great, especially knowing, um, as Raul shared with us, he has a very late flight tonight. So to be able to spend time with us, we really appreciate it. All right, sure. And but it was fine. It was fine. <laughs> Sorry, I can't see all the faces, but like, and so nobody for falls asleep. For all of our participants, um, you know, we whether we're in person or virtual, we love to do you know a raffle. Um, so all of you that are, are that have participated, we see all your names in the participant list on Zoom. We are going to do um, a random uh, number generation number generator. Ten of your names are going to be picked. You'll get an email by the end of the day tomorrow um, because you'll be getting a free bundle of picture books. Um, you can add to your classroom, um, add to a school library hold on for yourself or give to friends and family. Uh, so you'll be hearing from me very soon. Um, thank you so much, Raul. We really appreciate you having you, you here this evening. And thank you everyone for joining us. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.